All right, turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. We're going to continue our study. And last week we left at a bit of a cliffhanger. We had heard that Nebuchadnezzar the king had had a dream, a dream that had so troubled his soul that he called out all of his wise men and all of the empire to try to figure it out. Let's pray as we dive into this together. Lord, we ask for your help this evening as we look at your word. We pray that you would use this section of Daniel to help us see what we need to see about you, about ourselves, about your plan for world history, what you do with kings and empires. May we not leave this text without the rock-solid conviction that you are meticulously sovereign over all things that you indeed reign over the kings of the earth and your reign will one day be manifest on the earth. Lord, we long for that day. Give us eyes to see in your word this evening in Jesus' name. We discovered last week that Daniel and his friends were in a pickle along with all of the wise men of Babylon and their response to their trouble was to pray. Look back at verse 18 of Daniel chapter 2. Daniel and his friends prayed that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon and the head of the Babylonian empire. He had led his father's armies to a series of remarkable victories. He had secured his own power for his empire after the death of his father Nabopolassar. Egypt has been defeated, Palestine is owned, the surrounding nations are now paying tribute to Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar has secured for himself the best and the brightest from the nations that he owned. The Assyrian Empire is no more and will be lost in the sand for over two millennia. Nebuchadnezzar is on top of the world. What's next? He wondered when he went to bed what would happen. He had seen empires come and go. And God in his kindness answered Nebuchadnezzar's wonderings. God answered him in a dream. Of course, it's not the first time that God had spoken through a dream to a pagan ruler. It seems that God has an interest in upending their pride through this means. But this dream was so disturbing, clearly from the Lord inescapable in Nebuchadnezzar's heart and mind that he brought all the wise men of his realm to try to discern it. They had been trained for years in the Babylonian arts, dream interpretation, the divining omens, and they could not come up with an answer. And all the wise men of Babylon were facing extermination. I do not believe this was Nebuchadnezzar the irrational. I believe this was Nebuchadnezzar divinely disturbed. He had to have an answer, and he was relentless in pursuit of this answer because God was behind it. God wouldn't let him go. So Daniel asked time to give the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He gathered his three three friends, and they prayed. What would happen? They could all very shortly be delimbed, pulled apart. Prayers of faithful saints throughout history have gone unanswered or we might say, answered contrary to what they might have desired. Godly heroes had gone off the scene before with barely a mention. Do you remember Jonathan, Saul's son, David's loyal friend? He gets one sad half verse. It goes like this. And the Philistines killed Jonathan and Abinadab and Malkishua, the sons of Saul. Next story. We had chapters and chapters of... Jonathan's loyal love to David, Jonathan's recognition of Yahweh holding David's line as the next king of Israel rather than his own line. And when Jonathan was killed, he gets barely a mention. You remember that John the Baptist was beheaded as something of a party favor. The story of Daniel and his friends could have ended similarly right here in Daniel 2.19. They prayed, and God delivered them through delimbing. <laughs> but that's not what happened. 
Many faithful suffer along with the faithless. And here in Daniel chapter 2, God delivers Daniel and his friends. We have to recognize that in the sense of the idolatry and hypocrisy that had run rampant through Israel, Daniel, Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah were innocent in those matters. They were faithful to Yahweh, even as young men. And we see the faithful suffering alongside the faithless in God's righteous judgment on Israel in exile. What would become of Daniel and his three friends? How would their prayers be answered? Let's read together our text for the evening. Beginning in verse 19, we'll read through verse 35. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we have requested of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and spoke to him as follows, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me into the king's presence, and I will declare the interpretation to the king. Then Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, Neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future, and he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place." But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that was struck, the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. What is the point of all of this section? This is, of course, theological. God is doing something here through a dream interpreted by Daniel, given to Nebuchadnezzar. God here is unveiling the secrets of future history through a pagan king's dream. That's what's going on in this passage. And he's doing this not only to care for his people, to remind them that he is faithful to his promises, that he in fact is in charge of history, and he has not lost some cosmic stratego game to the deity next door. God in fact is putting his own glory on display as the peerless sovereign over all history, who alone can tell the future, because he makes the future. And we see, first of all, in verse 19, God answers prayer. We're just going to use the narrative here to form our outline. First of all, God answers prayer. Look at verse 19 in the first half of the verse, very short statement. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. This follows on the heels of verse 18. Daniel and his friends went and prayed, and God 
answer this prayer. We read next in verse 19 that Daniel ran to the king and declared to him the interpretation of the dream. No, that is not what happened. The next thing that happened is point two in your outline, Daniel blesses God. The narrative has been running away like a freight train. In fact, the the original text is clear in its grammar. This happens, then this happens, and then this happens. And all of a sudden, Daniel hits the pause button and stops. All this tension has been building. What is his dream? What is his dream? All, All the wise men in Babylon are about to be stretched out and their limbs torn apart and their houses turned to rubbish heaps. This is urgent. The king must know. The king is disturbed. He wants the interpretation. Arioch, the butcher, is running around ready to kill all the best and the brightest in order to get the interpretation. So what is it? And Daniel doesn't get there yet. Look at verse 19. Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And then you have these verses of praise. Daniel busts out in song. The story's been moving along. The tension's been building. We all want to know what the dream was and what it means. The narration has been running, hurrying, scurrying along, but now Daniel wants to sing. And notice what he does. He, he pauses to give praise to God. He's not moving on to the next task. H- have you ever prayed and, and really felt an urgency and a pressing need for something and God answers prayer and then you move on? Not so Daniel. His first impulse is to go before the Lord and give him praise. He and his friends had prayed. God answered. Daniel worships God. We need to unpack this explosion of praise. It is all about who God is and what he does. This is worship and gratitude. Notice what Daniel says in verse 20. Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. And God's personal name, Yahweh, is not mentioned here. Uh, probably the, the, the reference to God's name is just pent up here in the name. And the name of God is that which represented his character. All that God is and the totality of his attributes revealed to man is represented in his name. It stands for who he is. Let the name of God be blessed. That is, praised, worshipped. God is to be made happy by the adoration of his people. God seeks worshipers for himself. And here, Daniel is just such a worshiper. The idea for blessing here is the praise and thanksgiving that is due to God. And Daniel says, because wisdom and power belong to him. Think about those two words, wisdom and power. What God knows and what God does. What God knows is limitless. It is everything. And what God does is from infinite power. Daniel here is speaking of God's foreknowledge and his foreordination. That God, in fact, knows everything. Not only the king's secrets, but the king's dreams and the interpretations of the dreams. They're from God. But God knows the successive events of all the future world history. God knows everything. And God has power to enact everything that he desires. This is God's knowledge and his power. And God here is said to be the source of wisdom and power. They belong to him. They are from him. God himself is behind everything. And this is proven as Daniel's song unfolds. Look at verse 21. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. Times and epochs here are are periods of time, one uh, long and one a whole lot longer. These are seasons. And he's not talking about clocks and fall and summer. He's talking about the unfolding events of human history. This is contrary to the, the religious ideas of Babylon, either the fatalism that just says nobody's in charge and it's all at random, or the tug of war between regional deities. Well, none of those things are in charge. Mother Nature is not in charge. God is in charge. He is the one that changes the seasons. He changes the times and the epochs. That is, he directs the affairs of human history. An empire rises to power. Who's in charge of that? God. An empire falls and another one takes its place. Who is in charge of that? God is. He determines how long a king's reign is. 
He determines how long a nation will last. God is the one who determines the duration of feudalism or the length of the Middle Ages. God has determined the lifespan of the American experiment. It was God's will to humble Israel, and it will be God's will to humble the one who is humbling Israel. God will use Babylon as an instrument and then humble Babylon. Notice the next part of verse 21. God removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. Kings assume that they establish their own reigns. Wise men think that they come to their intelligence on their own. God is the one behind all of this. It is God who is writing the whole story of history. In verse 21, it is God who is the source of true wisdom and real knowledge. When we think about our epistemology, that is our theory of knowledge or how we know what we know, we need to get this right. If we are to know anything truly, it must be sourced in God. How we go about doing knowledge ought to be totally dependent. A right view of epistemology or a right view of the source of knowledge must abolish human pride. Man in his intellectual achievements thinks he comes to things, invents things, creates things out of nothing, and scientific inquiry at its best, at its best, is simply the discovery of what God already knows, what God has himself designed, and what God allows men to discover. Of course, scientific inquiry at its worst rejects God altogether, assumes an autonomy for man's reason, and figures that man can build his own intellectual tower of Babel and reach to the stars. God will show all of that to be folly. God's wisdom is not just better than the Babylonian training, than the world-class education that the Babylonian youths were getting. God's wisdom is fundamentally different. To have real wisdom must begin with the fear of Yahweh. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and you can't have real wisdom without it. Look at verse 22. God is the one, Daniel goes on, who reveals profound and hidden things. Literally, God is the one revealing the deeps and the hiddens. The Marianas Trench is 7.2 miles deep. It's hard to get down there. There's hidden stuff in there. We we have not finished exploring the depths of the oceans. In fact, it's terrifying what might be down there. But that which is inaccessible to us is fully accessible to God. In fact, He reveals it at His own will. The the hiddens are those things which are unknowable, the, the secrets. And listen, for us, All of the future is secrets. Some of those God has revealed. We get to know whatever future God has determined that we know by His Word. There's a sense in which believers who believe God's Word know a whole lot more than anybody else. We know the future or parts of it. But the parts of the future that God has not seen fit to reveal to us are secrets absolute darkness. They're unknowns and unknowables. By the way, if it hasn't happened yet, it's not real yet. God is the one who is in charge of these things. He's the one that we can trust. He's the one that's writing history. It's one of the fundamental reasons we don't have to worry. God's already in the future. He knows the future, has written the future, and has promised it good for all of His children. Sometimes we're more afraid of what, just the fact that it is a secret. We don't know what it is that stokes our fear. Look at verse 22, the second half. God is the one who knows what is in the darkness. There is not a place you can go in the universe that keeps a secret from God. He searches out everything. The darkness is as light to him. And notice the last part of the phrase in verse 22, and the light dwells with him. Literally, the the light is with him. It abides with him. He is where light is. God is the one who dwells in unapproachable light. Light dwells with him. He is, in fact, the light. 
And look at verse 23. Daniel's song ends with this directed to the Lord. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you, for you have made known to us the king's matters. Daniel appeals to the God of his fathers. He is identifying here with those who are his predecessors in the faith, those who believed God and who was credited to them as righteousness. It, Daniel is appealing here to God's own faithfulness to the fathers, God's covenant promises to them. Daniel is aligning himself with God's purposes, God's promises, his covenant-keeping faithfulness. And Daniel directs his praise to God because the God who has all wisdom and has all power, who reveals those things which are in the deeps and the hiddens, has given to Daniel wisdom and power and revelation. This was in answer to Daniel and his friends' prayer. Notice how Daniel expresses this, by the way. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you. Who's the we? Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel is including his friends in the praise of God for God's answering this prayer. This is a, a key to understanding Daniel's humility. We'll talk about that a little more this evening. Next in the story, beginning in verse 24, we have Daniel's report to the king. Daniel went into Arioch, verse 24, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and spoke to him as follows. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me into the king's presence, and I will declare the interpretation to the king. Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? What do we find here? Right after Daniel praises the Lord, he runs in and tells the king the interpretation. No, that's not what happens. Daniel stops Arioch in his tracks. Remember, Arioch's job description was chief executioner. He was the axe man. He was the one that was supposed to go around and kill all of the wise men one by one. And Daniel stops him and says, do not kill the wise men of Babylon. Notice the pause again here from Daniel. Daniel. The narration has been running us towards this dream and its interpretation, and we just can't quite get there. Daniel's going to pray, then Daniel's going to receive the dream, then Daniel's going to praise God for receiving the dream, then he's going to exercise compassion on his enemies by asking that they not be killed, all before he goes to see the king. And notice verse 25, Arioch goes to King Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, I have found... And the, the verb form there, I has found for myself. Arioch is a, a really good bureaucrat. You know, he's the kind of guy that doesn't have to take the blame when things go wrong in government, but he's the guy that's going to take the credit when they go right in government. This is good government work he's doing here. He can get some credit. He can get some prominence, maybe curry some favor from the king. The king's matter was urgent. I get to be the guy that tells the king. I mean, don't you like to be the one that bears good news? Arioch here is taking that on his shoulders. And he refers to Daniel as one from the sons of the captives of Judah. And he's interacted with Daniel already, but he's minimizing Daniel's prominence. He's elevated his own prominence and he's minimizing Daniel's here. He's just one of the captives. And one of the captives of Judah, every piece of that phrase is designed to bring Daniel down. And in verse 26, we get Nebuchadnezzar's response. And you can feel the anticipation in his voice. He said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able? King Nebuchadnezzar has been troubled, disturbed, terrified by this dream. And is there really someone on earth who's able to tell the dream and its interpretation? 
Of course, Daniel here gets called Belteshazzar. Daniel's not calling himself that. But in the king's court, he's referred to by his Babylonian name. Something like, Bel preserve the king. This is evidence of the Babylonification of the Jewish exiles. So we come to the fourth scene here in this narrative. Daniel relates the reason for Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We're still not getting to the dream itself or its interpretation. We get another pause from Daniel here. We might expect him immediately to say to Nebuchadnezzar, here's the dream, king, and here's its interpretation. That is not what we get from Daniel. Notice this pause here beginning in verse 27, and it is theological. Daniel is going to explain to Nebuchadnezzar, not the dream, not yet, not the interpretation of the dream, that won't come till verse 36, but here beginning in this verse, Daniel is explaining to Nebuchadnezzar why he had the dream to begin with. He's explaining to to Nebuchadnezzar, what is the God of Israel doing here? This is fascinating. Once again, Daniel has put the pause on the narration to give us what we need to see, to give Nebuchadnezzar what he needed to know. Daniel is going to give glory to God and explain to the king why he had the dream. This is all about the peerless identity of Israel's God, about his sovereign power, his unlimited knowledge, and God's own purposes. Look at verse 27. Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, Neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. Again, Daniel takes a dig at the Babylonian wise guys. They are absolutely unable to do what the king has asked. All of their books, all of their learning, all of their Babylonian arts could not accomplish things that only God could bring about. Daniel makes that absolutely clear. And in doing so, they get exposed, as we looked last week, but the fact that they are frauds. They've devoted their entire lives to a system of thought, a pursuit of so-called wisdom, and a religious enterprise that is an absolute nothing. It's an absolute nothing. At the very point, if you've spent your whole time developing this dream interpretation school, And when the king needs his dream interpreted, you have nothing to say. It's just emptiness. Daniel and company had studied their learning, but they had studied Babylonian learning not to believe it. There's a similarity to going to school and taking your biology class and studying evolution. Not to believe it. Not to commit your life to it. But to understand what's being taught. Daniel and his friends knew that God was the source of their wisdom. It's why they appealed to the God of heaven for compassions. That is the first thing Nebuchadnezzar needs to hear. None of his wise men were ever going to come to this answer. And and one might think at this moment that Daniel was about to say, but I have the answer. That is not what Daniel does. Look at verse 28. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. The God of heaven is the one that can do this. And again, this phrase, God of heaven, is a contrast to the Babylonian gods, the Babylonian deities who sort of lived around the earth and and they were marked by the sun and the moon and the stars. God is above all of those things. The one true God transcends the universe and he is the one who is able to reveal mysteries. Not your wise guys, not Daniel, but the God of heaven. And look at the second half of verse 28. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. God is doing something more than just revealing a mystery about what a dream means. God is teaching Nebuchadnezzar eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the end times. This phrase, in the end of days, literally is what Nebuchadnezzar has seen in his dream. This phrase, in the end of days, is used 14 times in the Old Testament. And every single time it has Israel in view, culminating in the age of Messiah. 
And, and each use is a little bit different flavor as the, the context demands the, the author who's speaking this phrase in the end of days is, is looking out at the horizon and seeing something beyond his own days. But each one of them terminates, culminates, finds its fruition in Messiah's reign, Messiah's work. God is doing something extraordinary here. He's not just disturbing a king's sleep like he did with Abimelech. He, he's not simply um, disturbing Pharaoh. Here, God is preaching eschatology. God is giving to Nebuchadnezzar a view of what will take place from his day, 600 BC, all the way until the end of, the, of man's age at the second coming of Messiah. Verse 29, Daniel details, uh, sorry, the last part of verse 28, this was your dream and the visions in your mind while in your bed. Daniel makes it clear that what God was telling Nebuchadnezzar through his dream was this, what would take place in the end of days. Verse 29, as for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future. And God who reveals mysteries, has made known to you what will take place. This is an interesting phrase because Nebuchadnezzar here is getting more than he asked for. Nebuchadnezzar did not ask anybody to interpret for him what he was thinking about when he went to bed. Only Nebuchadnezzar knew that. He didn't ask any of his wise men to conjure that up. And here, God through Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar not only Here's what your dream was, here's what your dream means, and here's what you were thinking about before you went to bed. This is a remarkable statement. God knew that you were concerned about your future, and the future is locked up, it's secret. Only God could know that. But of course, there are no secrets with Him. This would be startling if you were Nebuchadnezzar. This is like people on the earth during Jesus' earthly ministry when Jesus is reading minds and outing your conversations in public. He details Nebuchadnezzar's inner dialogue. Nebuchadnezzar wants to know what the dream meant. God unearthed not only the dream and its interpretation to display that he was the source of both of them, but God also made Daniel aware of what Nebuchadnezzar was thinking, thoughts that no one else could know. And finally, God is making known his own intentions. God is not obligated to tell us what he's thinking or what he's planning. And here he tells Nebuchadnezzar something of what he is up to. And then look at verse 30. As for me, says Daniel, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. God is making it clear here that his intention is to give this vision, this dream to Nebuchadnezzar, specifically to unveil his own thoughts, his own plans for future world history. And it wasn't Daniel who brought this about. Daniel is removing himself from taking credit for this at every turn. This mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me. Uh, more than any other living man, any more than any of your wise guys, any more than the lowest of the lowly on the earth. This is all God's work. You know, in our, our pride, we often hold on to truth, even if it's been given to us. We hold on to it as if we came up with it on our own. Sometimes we learn something new about God, some new truth in the workplace or something new at school, and we hold on to it as if it's ours, as if we owned it, maybe even as if we came up with it. And we feel the sense of envy when someone else can articulate it before we do. You remember in school, two plus two is class, oh, oh, and everybody's hand goes up and you're really disappointed when someone else gets called on because you knew the answer to that one. Intellectual pride goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Satan appealed to Adam and Eve to know things that God had cordoned off. It's really remarkable when we think about 
what Daniel does here, he disavows his ownership of revealed truth. God gave this. This is one of the reasons that elders, uh, one of the elder qualifications is that they not be a neophyte, a newbie, someone who has come recently to truth and an understanding of truth because that immaturity breeds intellectual pride, which Paul says is the snare of Satan. You remember the rhetorical question, what do you have that you did not receive? Why do you act as if it wasn't received? Nebuchadnezzar himself would later blow it in this very realm. He would say from the roof of his palace, is this not Babylon the great that I have made with my own hands? Look, he already got information here that God was the one who sets up kings, deposes kings. God is the one in charge of all of these things. Finally, we see in verses 31 to 35 the content of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Daniel lays it out for him, beginning in verse 31. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. And as soon as Daniel is articulating this dream, Nebuchadnezzar knows that Daniel's got it. That he has not only the dream, but is capable of giving the right interpretation. And Daniel describes that there was a single great statue, and that statue, which was large and of an extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. This is the word image. Oftentimes, the word image is used for an idol. This is not an idol here. It's just a statue. It's a a resemblance of a man standing, and it's giant very clearly, this is one great, dazzling, terrifying statue. And it is standing before Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar was terrified by the surpassing splendor of the giant statue. He was scared. This was a scary statue. Daniel describes it as having a head of gold, verse 32 of fine gold. Its breast and its arms were of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. This giant metallic statue would have been dazzling in the sunshine. A head of gold shining, silver and then bronze and then iron. And as you go down the statue, you work your way in the metals from that which is most precious to least Gold and then silver and then bronze. Bronze is copper alloyed with tin and then iron and then iron mixed with clay. You go from the costliest to the least costly. You also go from the heaviest, the most substantial, to the lightest. But you also go from the weakest or the softest to the strongest. Gold being the weakest and iron being the strongest until you get to the bottom, partly iron, partly clay. This is a a remarkable picture. We know that when Nebuchadnezzar built the statue in his own honor later in this book, it is some 90 feet tall, and he tells everybody to come and worship. We don't know how tall this statue was, but it's possible that Nebuchadnezzar fashioned his own statue after this. This colossus was terrifying. It was brilliant, dazzling, the text tells us. And verse 34 says that Nebuchadnezzar kept on looking. There is this continued idea of Nebuchadnezzar staring at this statue. He is simply in awe until something scarier than the statue shows up. It's a stone in verse 34. A stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. The stone here is a a rock, and it is cut out. Literally, the verb is, it's cut out for itself. There is a reflexive nature or a self-interest in this verb. This stone has done something for itself. It has cut out itself. It, It has removed itself from a mountain for a very specific purpose. And the word for cut out here is the word for determined, 
It is the same word used for one of the class of magicians earlier in this passage, the diviners, the determiners, those who read omens and signs and determine what the future is going to be. The same verb strikingly is used here of this stone. It is determining for itself what the future is going to be. This is a, a contrast in vocabulary to those hokey phonies. What is the future? What is the future going to be like? This stone is the future. And it's headed like a missile for this statue. It struck the statue. Old English versions, it smote the statue. That's just a good word. It smote the statue. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. And you would imagine maybe the iron and clay mixture would be the weakest part. I'm not sure that's the significance here. Uh, you, you may have the, the idea that the, the statue would then be toppled over. Something else happens altogether. By the way, this stone being determined for itself, cut out for itself, it's also said it's cut out without hands. That is, it's not man-made. This is something from another realm altogether. And in verse 35, we read that it shattered all at the same time the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold. The picture here is not that the, the clay-iron mixture were crushed and then the statue topples over and, you know, the, the, the gold head falls off, maybe gets a, a dent in the head, uh, maybe the, the, bent, the silver arms get bent up and the, the bronze midsection gets mangled and, you know, when, when iron bends and it, it groans and makes all of those awful noises and you get tweaked iron bars separate parts rolling around. That's not the picture at all. But all together as one, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, and then the mixed iron and pottery are all shattered at the same time, obliterated. The whole thing disintegrated into an undifferentiated cloud of dust. The whole statue is pulverized, vaporized. It's nuked to smithereens. Notice the second half of verse 35. They all became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The threshing floor was something like a barn, a, a building where the wheat was uh, cleaned and it was the good kernels were separated out from the chaff. The chaff was the really light material and you'd take your big fork into the, into the batch and you'd throw it up in the air and the light stuff would blow out just recently learned that English barns were built uh, with the prevailing winds and the doors open on both ends so that you could throw the wheat into the air and it would fall back into the barn and the, the chaff would blow out and the little stopper on the door ends of the barns, you know, the little ridge that comes up, we call that the threshold, right? Because it holds the thresh while the chaff blows out. And the picture here is that the, the, the wheat is being thrown and, and the chaff blows away. And chaff is the really light material. It's, it's easy for the summer breeze to just carry it off. And it's never seen again. But what's being carried off here? Gold, silver, bronze, iron, and pottery or clay. That is these really dazzling, significant, heavy, big, impressive things have been brought to nothing so that the summer breeze just throws it away like insignificant particles. They are reduced to absolute nothings. And notice it's all in one fell swoop. There's not a gradual overtaking. It's not like a, the stone is rolling down the hill and the statue starts to run away from it and they fight a little bit and one overcomes the other and there's this climax and a battle. No, it's just one shot and boom, the statue is gone. Pulverized, brought to absolute nothing in one single stroke. And it no longer exists. Like fine dust, it all goes away. And the stone goes on to fill the whole earth. Imagine being Nebuchadnezzar. This would be terrifying. What would you be thinking? 
all of your sycophants in your court have been walking around you all the time, hoping for some privilege and some status by being close to you, and they're saying, oh, king, live forever. They don't mean it, and you know it's not true. That is an empty call up against the reality of every one of Nebuchadnezzar's predecessors. Every prior kingdom and every former empire, they have all gone away. The Assyrians were dust. Necho was defeated. His own father was off the world stage. What would become of Nebuchadnezzar? You know he would be thinking about himself seeing this dream. What does that statue mean? Who is that statue? What does it represent? And look how it's destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar went to bed thinking about his own future. God read his thoughts. God gave him a dream to answer that question and many more. What did it all mean? Well, we get another cliffhanger. We'll get to the interpretation of the dream next week, beginning in verse 36. I want to drop back just a few moments and think about some of the things we've seen in this text. Think about Daniel's humility for a moment. At every point, Daniel rushes to the background. He clearly is the one that God has appointed to understand the dream. He has been placed by God at the heart of Babylon for this very moment, for these very reasons. And yet, God will get the glory at every stage. God would be in the foreground. It was God who gives the dream. No man on earth could do that, but there's a God in heaven. And even as Daniel is praising God, he's saying, thank you, God, for answering our prayers. And he includes his three friends. Daniel's compassion for the Babylonian wise men is striking. And he either stops Arioch from wiping them out after having already started, or he stops it before it starts. Either way, Daniel is thoughtful of others even in this crisis moment. To think about wisdom coming from God for a moment, we need to be humbled. We need to be reminded that everything we know that's worth knowing, God gets the glory for. God gets credit for. If we know something of His Word more than we used to, or we know things of His Word more than others do, Who gets the glory for that? God does. I think we're very quick, like Arioch, to say, I have found a passage. (laughs) Well, look, Daniel's the one that sought out Arioch. God has been so kind to seek us, to find us, to bring us to himself in the knowledge of the gospel. He gets all the credit in the world. Look, the difference between you and an unbeliever is not that you woke up one day smarter than the unbeliever, figured it out, and chose Christ, but because God rescued you when you were unable, when you were hopeless and helpless and spiritually dead. When you were bound up in the noetic effects of sin, that is, sin's infection of the mind, Your brain and your rational ability and your reasoning was a slave to sin. And God rescued you. Who turns on the lights? 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this world blinds the minds of unbelievers. But the light of the gospel is shown in our hearts by God so that we behold God's glory in Christ and in the gospel. Wisdom comes from God. We must ever be dependent on in how we go about knowing what we know. Listen, you always submit your rational abilities. You always submit your reasoning. You always submit your thinking and your feeling to God's word, to God's ways of thinking. And that leads us perhaps to a a final thought, um, a second final thought. I've got two more. Read your Bible Read your Bible. There's a significant lesson here in Daniel's song. And I, and I didn't take the time to go through all of these parallels, but there are parallels to Old Testament passages throughout this song, passages that predate Daniel's writing. 
Psalm 103, Psalm 113, 1 Chronicles 29, Job 12, Psalm 31, Psalm 75, 1 Kings 3 and 1 Kings 4, Job 26, Psalm 139, Isaiah 45, Psalm 36, Genesis 31, and Exodus 3 all show up in this song. The wording is so close that either Daniel was recalling these things to mind or they had been emblazoned on his heart, tattooed on his thinking by his exposure to God's word. This song didn't come out of nowhere. It didn't come out of a vacuum. Daniel clearly loved God's word. And remember, we, we might speculate a little bit about Daniel's youth. It, it, it was current to his own history that King Josiah found God's word in the temple and reinstated the reading of God's word and a love of God's word in Israel when Daniel was a boy. Whatever the case may be, Daniel clearly loves God's word, has rehearsed God's word, has hidden it in his heart, and it comes out in an explosion of praise in this song. And then one final word. Slow down your story. You think about your life. You go from activity to activity to activity, task to task to task. What did Daniel do in this narrative? I mean, grammatically, it's so striking, the narrative just stops because Daniel and his friends are going to pray. Because after God answers prayer, Daniel's going to sing a song of praise to God. And then before Daniel runs into audience with the king, he's going to have compassion on his enemies. He's going to think of others. And then even when he gets into the king's presence, here's the dream, here's the interpretation. No, Daniel slows the king down. Can you give me the interpretation? No, let me tell you about God. Daniel slows it all down. And it's all doxological. It is all about the glory of God. It is all about Daniel taking the background, God having the foreground in Daniel's dependence, in prayer, his gratitude in praise, and then his evangelism before the king. Listen, these things are our theology expressed. If we believe that God has all might and all wisdom, that he has ordained all things and he knows all things, if he has ordered all things after the counsel of his perfect will, if he is meticulously sovereign according to his good nature, then we can trust him. Instead of being so quick to go to the next task, maybe we just acknowledge him, give thanks to him, ascribe to him the glory that he is due. Let's pray. Lord, we want to do this even now, acknowledging that this that we have just read is your word. You are the revealer of truth. If you had not seen fit to pierce our darkness, we would still be blind. If you had not seen fit to make us receptive to truth, we would still be hard-hearted and slaves of sin. But God, you are so kind, so gracious. You are gracious in this book to reveal to us the future, even the distant future that we might know once and again that you are peerless, you have no rivals, there is no one like you. You are judge, and you will have your day. And Lord, while the times of the Gentiles persist, while man still has his day, we pray that we might be faithful, loyal to you in the face of difficulty. May we trust you, go to you in prayer, enlist our friends to go in prayer together long for your answers, be grateful as you answer, be bold before the kings of the earth. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.